This week we're going to be talking about global health and disease, and uh, I'm going to be talking to a professor of political science here at Wesleyan University, Jim McGuire, who works uh, on uh, global health and disease internationally, and we'll have a chance also to talk with some other guests uh, about the issues uh, that are uh, plaguing much of the world uh, and causing premature death uh, or the diminishment of, of capacities uh, of, of, of uh, our fellow global citizens. I want to start my part uh, of this week's discussion off with trying to give you some of the, the basic uh, facts around global health and disease and, uh, and as before we move into our our conversations, and I am drawing a lot of my information from uh, the World Health Organization, um, from uh, some demographers and uh, development economics uh, professors, uh, and from some foundations like the Gates Foundation that has been so active uh, in this sphere for, for many years. Uh, so some basic facts. Uh, let's start off with morbidity. I'm afraid this this week's uh, uh, discussion is is, is going to be focused on on uh, the least pleasant aspects of our global challenges. The top ten causes of death in the world are uh, first heart and circulatory diseases, a second stroke, a third lower respiratory uh, infections, a fourth lung disease. Fifth, diarrheal diseases. Sixth, HIV AIDS. Seven, uh, lung and lung-related cancers. Eight, diabetes. Nine, injuries, often from um, road accidents. And 10, deaths resulting from premature births. Now this is, uh, you know, we used to talk about the four horsemen, the, the great scourges of, of humanity. Here are the, the, the um, uh, 10 uh, leading causes uh, of, of death. And as, as you go through them, you see they uh, immediately, you'll think they, afflet, they affect different kinds of uh, people, people living in different situations differently. They, they affect different parts of the world differently. Uh, different income groups uh, will be variously affected and, and, and so forth. Uh, in wealthier countries, in wealthier countries, heart disease and stroke are the leading causes of death, followed by respiratory diseases and, and then Alzheimer-related diseases. You see, uh, in wealthier countries uh, where life expectancy is, is greater, they will be different causes of, uh, of death. Um, in poorer countries, uh, the countries we've been focused on in, in uh, much of the class so far, in, in poorer countries, HIV-AIDS, uh, lower respiratory infections and, and diarrheal diseases are the chief killers. And um, they, they are also the, 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 the diseases I think I can say we know the most about. We know um, some of the tools that uh, would enable us to stop the diseases or delay them uh, or reduce their frequency. Just again, give you some, give you some facts and you, know, you, you will hear more about this in, in other videos and there's a lot of information on the web. Here's a, 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 an important statistic. In high income countries, in high income countries, seven in every 10 deaths are come, occur among people 70 years uh, of age and older. Pretty impressive. Seven out of ten deaths in high-income countries occur to uh, people over 70 uh, years uh, old. Uh, people predominantly die of chronic diseases, uh, cardiovascular, cancers, dementia, chronic obstructive uh, lung diseases, uh, or diabetes. Only one in every 100 deaths are among children under 15 years old. Uh, it's a very different story as we move to different parts of the world. In low-income countries, then, nearly four in every 10 deaths are among children under 15 years old, 40%. And only two in every 10 deaths are among people age 70 and older. 
So you see the, the great disparity of experience uh, and life expectancy. People predominantly die of infectious diseases. That means a lower respiratory infection, HIV, AIDS, diarrheal diseases, and, and malaria, T tuberculosis. These remain scourges, uh, and uh, collectively they account for more than a third of uh, the deaths uh, in, in low-income countries. Still today, childbirth in low-income countries is a, is a dangerous uh, life event. Uh, childbirth and uh, prematurity are very significant causes of death in, in uh, these areas. And um, although we know how to reduce their frequency, uh, we don't get our knowledge and the resources behind what we know to the right places at the right time to reduce these frequencies. But let me just, you know, if I may, uh, just emphasize this disparity. In the rich countries, seven in every 10 deaths occur in people over 70, and in the poor countries, uh, uh, four in every 10 under 15, and only two out of every 10 for people over 70. So when we talk about health issues, we're obviously talking about, um, and morbidity, we're talking about nature, right? We're talking about nature. This is uh, uh, our lot in life as human beings is that we are mortal creatures and we're going to die. What we quickly get into and we talk about global health challenges uh, is um, how the social construction of our environment, how the political construction of our societies, how the um, uh, human impact on our environment changes the course of life and death for hundreds of millions of people uh, around the globe. And um, we also see that we can affect nature with, with uh, extraordinary results through the use of um, timely, uh, tested, and, uh, and, and, and resourceful interventions. But we don't do so consistently in many parts of the globe. And so the um, life trajectory of people around the planet is so different. Their experience of nature is so different. Their experience of their own bodies um, and of um, the capacity uh, to live a full life is so different depending uh, on geography, on income, um, and on politics, as we'll see as we move through our discussions this week. The World Health Organization uh, estimates that 23% of the global disease burden is attributable to the environment. Almost a quarter of what causes disease today around the world uh, comes from uh, environmental fac factors. Uh, the studies suggest that a third of the disease burden uh, among children is due to environmental factors we can change. And that, 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 that's the good news, right? The, 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 the kind of depressing and even frightening news is that um, we have created conditions for more and more disease. Uh, you see me change, uh, shifting in my chair all the time now. My, my doctor tells me that this is because the way I live, you know, sitting there as a professor or sitting reading books or looking at my computer all the time has wrecked havoc on my back. So this is a minor disease compared to what we're talking about. But I have constructed a way of life, as my doctor says, your back ain't made to do that, right? Your back ain't made to do that. That's the sad part for me. I go there, you know, and I, I'm, I'm getting old and I have to figure out how to, how to, how to live with an with a achy back. But the, the good news is there are actually things you can do to make an enormous difference. And that's what this class is all about, right, from the very beginning. And although we know that a quarter of the disease burden comes from environmental factors, we also know the things we need to do in order to reduce um, to what to many of us seems like the most um, dramatic or tragic uh, 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 consequence of disease, which is really early death, death among children that could have been prevented. And we can change the things that are causing those high rates uh, of morbidity. 
Children are, of course, are vulnerable to disease. They're, they can seem quite resilient in, in many respects, uh, but they um, uh, are really vulnerable to infection um, and uh, to the consequences of living uh, in extreme poverty. Children bear the highest death toll uh, with more than four million environmentally caused deaths uh, every year. These numbers become abstract, but please think that through. Four million environmentally caused deaths uh, yearly, and mostly in uh, developing countries. Four million uh, children uh, each year. The infant de death rate from environmental causes is 12 times higher in developing than in developed countries. 12 times higher. So that childbirth, uh, never an easy thing, even in a wealthy country, <laughs> um, is an extraordinarily fraught and dangerous procedure for mother and child in developing countries still today, despite what we know. So we're here today with Professor Jim McGuire, who is uh, in the government department at Wesleyan University and chair of the department now. Thanks for making time to talk to me and to our, our students here in this Coursera Wesleyan class called How to Change the World. My pleasure. And uh, our theme this week, as you know, is uh, disease and global health. And, uh, you know, I think for some people, some uh, political scientist is not the first the kind of person they think of as being uh, the person working on health issues. So how did you first got, get involved with the issues of global health? Well, it was actually through my teaching here at Wesleyan. I was teaching a class in the early 1990s called Political Economy of Developing Countries. And in the course of uh, preparing the class, I uh, encountered the work of Amartya Sen. Ah, yes the philosopher and economist at, at Harvard. And uh, 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 he has the idea that, uh, you know, the goal of human development is the expansion of human capabilities. Yes. And for Sen, you know, a very important capability is the capability uh, to survive physically from right. one day to the next. So um, I got quite interested in his work and at the same time in the course I was teaching a unit on why the East Asian countries have developed more successfully in terms of economic growth and income inequality than the Latin American countries. And it occurred for, to me that like, whenever people compare East Asian countries and Latin American countries, the East Asian countries always win, uh -huh. but the criteria are always income-related criteria. and. Why hasn't anybody ever tried to compare the two regions on things like infant mortality and yep. life expectancy? Mm -hmm. So I got quite interested in capabilities, capability expansion, physical survival. Of course, health issues are very closely related to that. So it was actually through my teaching right here at Wesleyan that I changed my whole research program. That's interesting. Before that, I was trying to study uh, why some countries do better than others at establishing and consolidating democracy mm -hmm. and the country on which I focused was Argentina. So this was a radical turn yeah. in my research program and it was all related to the teaching and I think actually my teaching has influenced my research as much as my research has influenced my teaching. That's really interesting. Uh, I, I know that many of the people even in these online classes where we don't have the same kind of con contact with students as you would in a, in a, a, a physical classroom, you wind up um, developing ideas and approaches that uh, change the nature of the scholarship you do. Uh, we are reading some of Martin Sen in the class, at least uh, we've assigned that for, for this week. And, and uh, in, in, in your book, uh, Wealth, Health, and Democracy in East Asia, you use this capabilities uh, approach. Right, um, yeah. And uh, so maybe I should just uh, uh, go on with the, with, the, with the naive question. So wealth and health, how are they connected? Uh, well, there's uh, one hypothesis out there, which is known as the wealthier is healthier mm -hmm. hypothesis, which says that both wealthier individuals and wealthy countries and wealthy subnational units within countries like provinces or states right. are going to be healthier with health measured in terms of, that can be measured in a variety of ways, but one way of course is through mortality mm -hmm. indicators like life expectancy and infant mortality. Mm -hmm. 
And it's quite true that when you look at levels, wealthier is definitely healthier. If you look cross-nationally, which is basically the area that I work in, um, countries that have higher levels of economic affluence have lower levels of infant mortality and longer life expectancy. So that's absolutely true for level. But when you look at progress, Mm -hmm. the relationship is much weaker. For example, if you look in the year 2010, compare all the countries in the world, you'll find a a very strong relation between level of GDP per capita, gross domestic product Mm -hmm. per capita, which is a measure of overall affluence, and say the infant mortality rate. Right. But if you look at progress at achieving economic growth over say a 50 year period, 1960 to Mm -hmm. 2010, and you look at progress at reducing infant mortality over that same 50 year period, Mm -hmm. the relation is much weaker. Mm -hmm. So the wealthier is healthier conjecture holds much better for level than it does for progress. And this is important because actually how countries do at progress is more important from both theoretical and practical standpoints uh, than you know what level they had achieved in yeah. 2010 because say the level of economic affluence that a country has achieved in 2010 or the level of infant mortality that it's achieved in 2010 reflects factors going back millennia that's right, right. whereas if you just look at progress during a particular span of time that's a lot better for extracting policy lessons and yeah. other things that are you know amenable to human intervention yeah so you know if you look at only at levels and neglect progress which is what a lot of people in the wealthier is healthier tradition do i think that biases policy solutions toward you know, thinking that the role of a government or even of a private sector organization is simply to increase the overall economic affluence of the population. Right. And if you do that, people's health will take care of it of itself. I see. But uh, if you look at progress, that's definitely not true. That's not the case. There are some countries that have done really well at economic growth, but not very well at reducing premature mortality and other countries that have done very poorly at economic growth, but extremely well at reducing premature mortality. And is that, is that due to the fact that you can have uh, significant economic growth without a g- great redistribution of that wealth across sectors? In other words, if you, it, does the wealthy or is healthier hypothesis work if, if you disaggregate the population, like the people who are wealthier in the population are in fact healthier, or does, you see what I mean? In other words, if, if a region gets much wealthier, but infant mortality stays high, is that because the poor, the poor are still poor and those are the ones who are dying? Uh, or is it, is it because that wealth doesn't matter as much as we thought it did about infant mortality? I'd say it's a little of both, that you, know, you can have rapid economic growth and a bad income distribution. Well, that's worse for reducing premature mortality right. than having rapid economic growth and a very low level of income inequality, but it's not all about income inequality. It's not all about the money. No, it's not all about the money because, uh, let's face it, like what needs to be done to reduce premature mortality is mostly very cheap types of interventions. And you can have a country, a good example is Chile. Right. Say Chile during uh, the first 10 years of Pinochet's Right. Uh, dictatorial military government from 1974 to 1983. Uh, they were poorer in 1983 than they were in 1974. GDP per capita went down. Mm-hmm. Income inequality skyrocketed and income poverty went from 20 to 30 percent of the population. Mm. Nevertheless, General Pinochet managed to reduce the infant mortality rate in one decade faster than anyone else in human history. In 1974, the infant mortality rate was 65 infant deaths per 1,000 log mm-hmm. births. By 1983, uh, it was 19 per thousand. Wow. This was a plunge. So income distribution got worse and GDP per capita declined. What happened is that the government 
for reasons that still remain to be revealed because, as Dresden Sen pointed out, General Pinochet does not have a reputation as a soft-hearted do-gooder. Right, right. He actually uh, introduced these extremely inexpensive maternal and infant healthcare policies, particularly in very impoverished areas of the country, urban shanty towns, remote rural areas, and these extremely cheap interventions more than made up for the lousy economic growth and terrible worsening of income inequality and income poverty. Yeah, that's fascinating. So not only is it not just a matter of economic growth, it's not even a matter of economic growth plus income di yeah. distribution. The public provision of basic social services on its own can be really effective. So the public, I want to hold on to that, the, the, pu the public distribution, Say that again. <laughs> well, it's the public provision. Public provision of basic, basic services. social services. Yeah. And also, you can't look only at the supply side. Yeah. You have to look at the demand side as well. Services not only have to be provided, they have to be utilized. Yeah. So right. you've got to look at the conditions under which people are willing and able to use even putatively free social services. Right. like. They might have to take time off work right. or take a bus to the right. health clinic or, or whatever. So you got to look at the utilization side as well as the provision side. Mm -hmm. So how does, how does this kind of um, background plug into the capabilities um, framework? Okay. Because, because uh, you know, you, I can imagine why some social scientists are interested in measuring income or even income distribution. And you can measure GDP, you can measure mortality, but how, how, do you, how do you get at the capabilities as something you can, you can understand and track over time? Well, I guess, uh, you know, I view the capabilities approach uh, and capabilities themselves basically um, the expansion of human capabilities equals the expansion of a person's ability to lead a thoughtfully chosen life. 